I'm an agent for a top-secret division of the CIA known only as The Division. Most people don't even know we exist, but we operate as an elite unit, handling only the most sensitive threats against the United States. We're called in when a situation is too politically risky or dangerous for normal operatives to deal with. I've seen things in my years with the division that would shake most seasoned agents to their core. But it's my job to face the darkness, so America can stay in the light. I first joined the CIA straight out of college. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do yet, but knew I wanted to serve my country and make a difference in the world. I started off as an analyst reading reports and writing assessments about global threats and emerging issues. It was fascinating work, but I always felt stuck behind a desk. That's when I got recruited by the division. They saw my aptitude tests and noted my high marks in critical thinking. More importantly, they noticed I wasn't afraid to voice opinions and challenge norms if it meant protecting people. Those traits make you stand out in the regular company, but in the division, they want independent thinkers. Agents who are willing to take risks and operate in moral gray areas in order to uphold the ideals of freedom and security back home. The missions are dangerous, the methods are unorthodox, and you won't get any public recognition or medals. The work we do doesn't officially exist. But I wasn't in it for the glory. I became an agent to save lives by doing what no one else could or was willing to do. In the division, you're trained to get in and out of hostile territory undetected, to blend in with any environment. Your mind needs to be as sharp as your reflexes, always scanning for information and threats. We get access to cutting-edge technology and weapons, with brilliant scientists developing new gadgets and bio-enhancing serums. Also, we can take on threats beyond normal human limitations. Threats from brilliant yet twisted minds who have unique methods of spreading chaos and death. My first field operation was infiltrating a Chechen terrorist cell that had stolen a dirty bomb. If they deployed it in Moscow, it would kill thousands and start a war in the region. I was tasked with posing as a Russian arms dealer to gain the leader's trust and locate the bomb. The mission was difficult, but I managed to identify the safe house through coded conversations. We swooped in silently with a Tier 1 team and had it disarmed within hours. That night, as I saw news reports showing crowds of people who would never know their lives were saved, I knew I found my calling. To take on these vital but thankless missions, operating in the shadows so others can walk safely in the light. Over the years, I've disrupted bioweapon labs in North Korea, stopped Russian sleeper agents from assassinating diplomats, and prevented Mexican cartels from releasing weaponized hallucinogens into water supplies. The list of close calls and averted tragedies kept growing. And with it, my reputation within the division as someone who always got the job done, no matter how ugly it got. I thought I had seen it all in this line of work, but my last mission took me somewhere I didn't expect. I sat down in the dimly lit room, awaiting my briefing. The door opened, and my handler, Agent Johnson, entered. He cut right to the chase. We have a situation that requires your specialized talents. A rogue scientist has set up an illicit laboratory in a remote village in Eastern Europe. Rumor is, he's developing a dangerous new bioweapon. I raised an eyebrow. Any ideas on the scientist's identity or objectives? Agent Johnson slid a file folder across the table. The target is Dr. Vladimir Rostin, a Russian microbiologist who disappeared five years ago. We believe he's planning to sell his new bioweapon to terrorists and hostile regimes. I flipped through Dr. Rostin's profile. He had been involved in highly classified research before his disappearance. This made him dangerous. So I'm being tasked with infiltrating his lab to find out what he's developed and then shut down the operation permanently, I said. Correct. This mission cannot be traced back to the U.S. You'll be disavowed if captured or killed. We need someone with your skills to handle this covertly. I nodded. As an agent of the division, I was trained for these types of high-risk solo missions. Just point me toward the village and I'll take care of the rest. 
Three days later, I was on a plane to Eastern Europe, ready to seek out Dr. Rostin's lab. I flew into the capital city under my cover identity, Thomas Kemper, an unsuspecting American tourist visiting to see the old world sites. Once I landed, I ditched any identifiers and vanished into the urban landscape. I made my way to the train station and caught the next ride out to the rural countryside. As the train whizzed through endless rolling green hills and farmhouses, I reviewed the intel packet on Roston and his known associates. My best bet was to check quiet villages far from the capital, where Roston could operate in secret. After a full day on the trains, I arrived in a quaint little rural village surrounded by forests and fields. Time to get to work. I needed to blend in, so I rubbed dirt on my face and clothes to look like a harmless vagrant wandering from town to town. With my backpack and layers of tattered clothing, I looked the part. I spent the next two weeks hiking from one sleepy village to the next, observing and chatting up locals to gauge their openness to outsiders. Most were welcoming and helpful, no traces of Roston. But eventually, I came across a secluded community nestled deep in the Carpathian Mountains that seemed suspicious. An ominous fog clung to the area, diffusing the sunlight passing overhead. I watched the town square from nearby bushes and noticed the locals actively avoided eye contact or speaking with the few passers-by. One man I approached hurried past me, anxiously glancing around to see if anyone had noticed him conversing with an outsider. Strange behavior in such a remote area. When night fell, I witnessed military cargo trucks rumbling down the road toward a large, official-looking building on the town's outskirts. Guards with rifles stood watch outside. The trucks returned back down the mountain pre-dawn. This had all the markings of Roston's lab. Jackpot. I found an abandoned shack on the edge of town to operate from. Each day, I shadowed villagers, noting their routines and conversations. At night, I crept up the mountain through the trees to observe the lab compound in detail, getting a feel for security rotations and potential entry points. One evening, I witnessed a large guard drag a crying woman into the lab. She was bound and limping badly. What inhuman experiments was Roston subjecting these poor villagers to? It made my blood boil, but I had to stick to the mission plan. Stop Roston, secure his research, and destroy the lab. Justice would be done here. As the days passed, I noticed more and more villagers exhibiting bizarre antisocial behavior, violent outbursts, seizures, twitching, and paranoia. Some seemed almost possessed. At night I could hear piercing screams echoing from the direction of the lab. Roston was sadistically using these people as human guinea pigs. My surveillance left no more doubt. This village lab was running brutal human trials, and I had to get inside to find out why. I was Angel's only hope to expose Roston's operation and shut it down for good. Delay risked countless lives if he moved or deployed his bioweapon. It was time to infiltrate the lab. I spent that day resting in preparation, cleaned my gear, sharpened my knives, ran through entry tactics in my mind. Come nightfall, I would make my move. Roston's evil work ended now. The next night, I made my move to infiltrate the lab. I waited until the moon sank below the ridge, cloaking the valley in darkness. Donning night vision goggles, I crept downhill through the trees toward the glowing lights of the compound. The lab was surrounded by chain-link fence topped with barbed wire. But I discovered a section behind the back well that was unmonitored. I clipped through the fence links with bolt cutters and slinked onto the grounds, staying in the shadows. Up ahead, two guards with rifles patrolled the front entrance, while more men periodically circled the perimeter. I avoided their sweeps and approached a side door. The electronic keypad gave me momentary pause before I pulled out a descrambler device to hack in. A few anxious minutes later, the door clicked open. I was inside. The fluorescent-lit hallway was sterile and empty. It seemed most of the staff had left for the day. Moving swiftly down the corridor, I scanned for lab rooms or security checkpoints. Turning a corner, I spotted a reinforced door marked 
Authorized personnel only. Worth investigating. I examined the card reader lock. This would require an ID badge to open. A quick search of nearby offices turned up a badge left on a scientist's desk. Hopefully, it provided sufficient access. I held my breath and swiped the card. The reader blinked green and unlatched the door. Inside was a sprawling research lab with rows of tables holding an array of equipment, microscopes, centrifuges, incubators. The back wall was lined with glass chambers filled with fluids, test tubes, and active cell cultures. One section contained an array of unusual machines I couldn't immediately identify. This had to be Rostin's main bioweapons development lab. I slipped inside and began photographing everything. Research notes, formula diagrams, hard drives. Anything that could provide insight into Rostin's activities. In one testing log, the results mentioned neurotoxicity levels and psychosis-inducing effects. Chilling terms. In an adjacent room marked clinical trials, I was horrified to find hospital beds with humans strapped down and muttering incoherently, violently shaking and twitching against their restraints. They seemed almost possessed. On a nearby chart were photos of the same individuals looking healthy and normal during the pre-exposure assessment. Rostin was using these innocent villagers as lab rats, injecting them with his experimental bioweapons to study their effects. It was appalling. I had to put a stop to it immediately. Just then, I heard voices approaching down the hall, guards making their nightly rounds. I quickly looked for somewhere to hide and slipped under a desk just as two men entered, speaking Russian. Have they found the American spy yet? One asked. The other replied, No, but security is on high alert. He won't get far. My blood ran cold. Somehow my presence had been detected. I would need to work fast. As soon as the guards exited, I relocated to the office where I found the lab notes on the neurotoxin bioweapon. This complex chemical formula and testing data could help division scientists devise an antidote. I photographed every page before stashing the file in my pack. It was time to slip away undetected with the intel I'd acquired but exiting would be tougher with the perimeter on high alert. As I cautiously exited the lab toward the rear fire door, the hallway suddenly filled with blinding light and an ear-splitting siren wailed. Intruder alert! I had tripped a silent alarm. Shouts in Russian echoed from all around as guards charged toward my location. No more need for stealth. I sprinted headlong down the corridors, retracing my route. Bursting outside, I was met by spotlights and alarms blaring from all structures. My only escape was the way I'd come in, through that hole in the fence. Rifle shots rang out, bullets peppering the ground around my feet as I weaved between buildings, making for the perimeter. The exit was so close, just across the open yard. I pushed my muscles to their limit, my lungs burning. With freedom in reach, a searing pain stabbed through my left shoulder. I had taken a hit, but there was no turning back now. I dove through the torn fence opening and vanished into the night, biology notes and tissue samples secured safely in my pack. Behind me, the lab guards shouted furiously at the darkness, but the hunt was just beginning. With the whole village on high alert looking for me, I couldn't risk staying in town. I retreated to the thick forests on the outskirts taking shelter in an abandoned, crumbling cottage I discovered half-collapsed among the trees and overgrowth. It wasn't much, but would provide cover while I recovered and planned my next moves. From the cottage attic, I maintained surveillance on the lab compound using binoculars. The activity there was frenzied in the aftermath of my break-in. Patrols had tripled, and floodlights now illuminated the grounds at night. Through the windows, I could see Rostin barking orders, his neck in a brace from the bullet that barely missed during my escape. He was clearly rattled, but unfortunately still very much operational. His bioweapons research was rapidly progressing each day. I had to stop him soon, before he could distribute this deadly neurotoxin. I took stock of my meager resources. My weapons, gear, and intel were intact. 
but I was exhausted, bruised and bloody from the retreat through the woods, and I still had a bullet lodged in my left shoulder. Using first aid supplies from my pack, I managed to disinfect and tightly bandage the wound to stop further blood loss. The pain was intense as I dug out the misshapen bullet using a hunting knife sterilized with whiskey from my flask. The procedure left me lightheaded and weak, but removed the internal shrapnel hindering my mobility. I rested as much as I could while trying to formulate a plan. My break-in had alerted Roston to my presence, but hadn't significantly derailed his operation. I needed to neutralize him for good, as well as any existing bioweapon samples, lab equipment, and research. But in my current condition, with limited arm strength and this entire valley on high alert, a direct assault would be suicide. My only hope was calling in a heavily armed CIA cleanup crew to level the lab and secure the research. However, my only form of communication was an encrypted satellite watch, disguised to look like a regular timepiece. It had an extremely limited battery charge, and I had to be outside with a clear view of the sky to get a signal. I would have one shot at contacting headquarters when conditions allowed. I spent the next week hiding in the dilapidated cottage, recovering my strength as I watched the lab activity. Patrols through the woods meant only moving at night to scavenge for food from deserted farmhouses, avoiding detection. One evening, I awoke to the sound of heavy rain pounding the cottage roof. Going outside, I saw that a colossal thunderstorm had moved into the valley, unleashing its full fury on the mountainside. Deafening thunderclaps shook the ground while lightning streaked across the sky, illuminating the trees like camera flashes. This intense storm was the cover I'd been waiting for. The electromagnetic energy could boost my watch's transmission strength for a clear signal. Under the thunder's roar, the sound of my encrypted call would be muted to any close listeners, and the stormy darkness provided natural concealment. I had to try now. Stripping off the watch's camouflage band, I extended the mini satellite antenna and input the coded message for my handler. Roston Bioweapon Lab located, mission compromised, require immediate armed backup. Cleanup and containment are essential. Send coordinates. With the tap of a button, my plea was transmitted. Now it was just a matter of surviving until help arrived. I didn't know how long that would take or if the message even went through, but I had done all I could. I laid low in the ruins over the next week, evading search teams and surviving off whatever scraps I could pilfer from the ghost town at night. Each day, I checked my watch hopefully for any response light, but only silence greeted me. Just as I was losing faith, eight days later, a single red blink lit up the watch face. I had a coded response from headquarters. Backup dispatched but delayed due to security. Arrival in 48 hours. Maintain position. I sighed with relief. Help was coming. I just needed to keep my wits and avoid capture for two more days. A week passed with no response. My food was running out and Roston's men were searching everywhere for me. Just when I thought my rescue request had failed to transmit, a tiny red light blinked on my watch. I had an incoming coded message. It was from Johnson back at Division. Backup was on the way, but had been delayed due to heavy security. I just needed to hold on a little longer. They would be here in two days. Relief washed over me. With help coming, I only needed to lay low a bit more. Once my fellow Division agents arrived, we would shut down Roston and his bioweapon program for good. I was tired hungry and filthy after weeks of living like a sewer rat. But none of that would matter once the mission was complete. For now, I just had to avoid capture or death for two more days. Easier said than done, considering I was being hunted in a hostile village filled with Roston's henchmen. But I was a highly trained agent of the division. I would persevere and finish this critical mission. The next 48 hours would decide the fate of thousands if not millions, of lives. I pushed any fears aside. Failure was not an option. I would do my job, no matter the cost. After surviving nearly two weeks alone in the hostile valley, I awoke in my hideout to distant snaps and rustles outside. I feared Roston's men had finally hunted me down. 
Grabbing my pistol, I slowly peered out the cracked window. But instead of soldiers, I saw four camouflaged figures stealthily approaching, heavily armed with assault rifles and tactical gear. The cavalry had arrived. I cracked open the door and called out softly, Blue Jay. The lead agent responded Oriole, the correct code phrase. After confirming their credentials, I hurried them inside. Agents Johnson, Tyler, Cole, and Reed reporting for duty, sir, the lead man said, handing me a sealed envelope from Division Command. One hell of a trip getting here quietly, but wouldn't miss the party. I quickly briefed them on the situation. Rostin has developed a potent neurotoxin capable of mass mind control. He's tested it on the villagers here with devastating results. I showed them my photos of the human experiments and formula notes. They shook their heads at the barbarity. Agent Cole spoke up. This has gone way beyond intelligence gathering. We need to raid the lab in force and take Rostin down, either capture or kill. No containment or cleanup this time. We light the place up. Tyler nodded, checking his rifle. Agreed. This situation is out of control. That toxin cannot leave this valley. I pointed to the lab on a map. Rostin has tripled security since my break-in. Getting inside will be difficult, but speed is critical. Johnson added, Settlement leadership wants this handled quietly. But once we're inside, all bets are off. We do whatever it takes to stop this threat here and now. Understood, I replied. Rostin poses a grave danger to global security. He has to be neutralized before we lose any chance of containing this. Reed chimed in. We'll follow your lead on the operation plan. You know the site and villagers, but this ends tonight, one way or another. I checked my gear one last time. Okay, gentlemen, we move out in 20 minutes. Check weapons and prepare for anything once we breach the lab. Rostin will not go quietly. Cole racked his shotgun. Roger that. We'll be ready with plenty of persuasion. The team set to prepare for the assault ahead. We had one shot at this. Failure risked unleashing an unstoppable mind control plague upon the world. Either Rostin would be brought to justice tonight, or the lab would burn. There was no other option. That night, we approached the lab under cover of darkness. I led the team to the weakened section of fence I had used previously. We slipped through and stealthily neutralized two roving perimeter guards with silenced pistols. So far, so good. I led the squad down a side corridor toward the research wing. We encountered two patrolling guards along the way, who were quickly subdued before they could raise an alarm. Agent Cole stood watch over their unconscious bodies. No going back now, he said grimly. At the lab entrance, I swiped the stolen keycard and the door clicked open. Inside, the team swiftly fanned out to secure the room. The lab appeared deserted at this late hour. No signs of life, reported Agent Tyler, sweeping his rifle around. Okay, let's move quickly, I said. Download anything that looks useful. We inserted flash drives and began copying data from the computers, research logs, formula files, equipment diagrams, anything related to Rostin's bioweapon development. Meanwhile, Agent Reed called out from an adjacent room, In here, you need to see this. We joined Reed and were horrified by what we saw on a monitor. Video files showing human test subjects strapped down and exposed to Rostin's neurotoxin. The victims thrashed against their restraints, their minds violently destroyed by the effects of the virus. My God, muttered Johnson. He's tested this on his own villagers like lab rats. The rest of us stood in silence, shaken by the gruesome experiments. This ends tonight, declared Johnson, ejecting the drive containing the videos. We purge this whole nightmare. In Rostin's personal office, we uncovered more research clearly laying out the true scale of his plans. He sought to develop aerosol delivery methods and build a mind control network. With this, he could turn whole populations into programmable slaves, I said. This is worse than we thought. He needs to be stopped now before he perfects this. Johnson's expression was grave. Agreed, our orders are clear. Rostin does not leave this facility alive. 
Just then, alarms blared and lights flashed as our presence was detected. They know we're here. Move out, shouted Johnson. Instead of retreating, we decided to push forward into the facility toward Rostin's personal office and quarters to find him. As we advanced, heavy footfalls approached as guards rushed to intercept us. We took up positions in the hallway, using the corridor corner as cover. As the guards showed themselves, we unleashed controlled bursts from our rifles, dropping them before they could effectively return fire. They had numbers, but we had experience and training. We leapfrogged down the hall in this way, leaving a trail of bodies. Cole, Reed, take point, I ordered, as we approached Rostin's secure wing. Using breaching charges, we blew open the fortified entrance and quickly neutralized two more guards inside. Alarms continued blaring, but no other defenders immediately presented themselves. We entered the main neurotoxin development lab, housed behind armored glass. Burn it all, said Johnson. Cole and Tyler opened fire with incendiary rounds, shattering the glass and igniting the lab equipment and rows of chemicals. Flames erupted around us, fed by the volatile substances, as we continued toward Rostin's office. Inside, we seized all documentation and data storage related to his schemes before rigging the room to explode. As we prepared to make our escape, klaxons sounded and a voice came over the intercom system. You will not leave here alive. I will burn your minds as you have burned my work. It was Rostin. His voice was strained, clearly unhinged by our raid on his facility. Just then, one of the office walls burst open as a crazed, horrifying figure charged into the room. It was one of the test villagers, transformed into a homicidal monster by Rostin's virus. His eyes were bloodshot and wild, devoid of reason. He bellowed and attacked us with superhuman speed and strength, shattering lab equipment and shrugging off gunshots. We narrowly ducked the deranged man's attack long enough for Cole to grab a fire extinguisher and crush his skull. Everyone okay? I shouted. We took stock of our situation quickly. Rostin's unleashed his human weapons against us now, said Reed. We need to get out of here. I nodded. Copy that. Move, move. Escape was now our only priority. We fought our way through smoke-filled corridors illuminated by the growing blaze. The roar of the flames drowned out our gunshots as we cut down the guards rushing to stop us. Rostin's rage-filled voice continued taunting us over the facility's PA system amidst the chaos. You cannot stop my glorious revolution. Your minds will be the first to burn. We blocked out his ranting to focus on making it outside in one piece. The exit was just ahead past the containment rooms. Bursting through the steel doors outside, we found ourselves surrounded on all sides by a large crowd of infected villagers, at least 30 or more. They were deranged with bloodlust from the effects of Rostin's neurotoxin coursing through their veins. Their eyes were wild and bloodshot as they growled and shrieked at us. The virus had destroyed their free will, turning them into mindless puppets driven by uncontrolled savagery. They began advancing aggressively, holding weapons and tools in a threatening manner. Stay together. Don't let them isolate us, shouted Johnson. The infected villagers moved with unnatural speed and reckless abandon as we fired bursts into their midst to keep them back. Our shots found their marks, but barely slowed their advance as they felt no pain or fear, only psychotic rage induced by Rostin's toxin. We had to get past them to the fence somehow. Making a break toward the torn section I had used previously, we shot our way through the infected mob while they clawed and swung wildly at us. Tyler took a rake to the back, but kept moving with our support. I looked into their diseased eyes as we cut them down and saw no glimmer of recognition or humanity left in these people I had lived among for weeks. Friends and even family members were now reduced to vicious monsters by Rostin's virus. Still, escape was our only option. Don't stop firing, I yelled as we retreated in bounds toward the fence under continuous fire. A final group of infected villagers pursued us closely in a frenzy. Reed and Tyler turned and laid down suppressing fire to halt their advance as we reached the torn fence line. 
We dove through the opening and immediately took up defensive positions to cover the team's full escape. The constant rifle shots kept the crazed horde at bay long enough for all of us to slip outside the compound perimeter into the open field beyond. From there, we quickly disappeared under the pale moonlight into the thick forest tree line for shelter, having successfully completed our mission. Behind us, the facility burned brightly, illuminating the night sky. The lab was fully ablaze, and Rustin's research was destroyed. But his voice still echoed from the compound loudspeakers amidst the raging flames. You have only prolonged the inevitable. I will find you. We retreated through the dark woods to a small hunting cabin I had discovered weeks earlier as a potential shelter. It was only a mile from the lab perimeter, but seemed far enough to lie low for now. Once safely inside the musty, single-room structure, we quickly caught our breath and took stock. Miraculously, despite some injuries, we had all made it out in one piece. I gave Johnson the satellite comms device to Radio Division Command for extraction. Meanwhile, the rest of us assessed our situation. The core mission was accomplished. All data and physical samples related to Rostin's neurotoxin were destroyed beyond recovery in the lab fire. But Rostin himself had escaped and remained an extremely dangerous threat given his intimate knowledge of the toxin's molecular makeup and effects. Even with his lab destroyed, his scientific skills made him incredibly dangerous if allowed to roam free. Johnson got off the radio with Division. Extraction is not possible until nightfall. We need to dig in here until they can send a chopper under cover of darkness. I nodded, having expected this. We should be safe here for now. I'll take the first watch. The exhausted team found places to catch a few hours of sleep. When morning came, I briefly woke Johnson for a status update. We agreed simply to remain hidden in the cabin all day. No one rested easy, constantly listening for any sounds of approaching trouble. Around midday, Cole voiced what everyone was thinking. This mission isn't over, not by a long shot. Rostin still got that formula in his head. He gets to the right people. This threat goes global. I tried reassuring him. Rostin lost his lab, his data, samples, everything. That sets him back years. Without resources, he poses much less of a danger now. But Johnson cut in. Doesn't matter. The intelligence community wants Rostin eliminated ASAP. He's too great a liability otherwise. I knew Johnson was right. Rostin would stop at nothing to exact revenge on us and rebuild his operation. And he had loyal mercenaries still embedded throughout the region. We needed to end this threat for good. As the sun set, we did final weapons checks and prepared for the next confrontation. The helicopter would be here in an hour. Then we'd hunt Rostin down and finish this once and for all. We decided to capture some of Rostin's guards alive for interrogation instead of eliminating them all. We needed intel on his location and plans. Under cover of darkness, Cole and Reed stealthily abducted two patrolling guards near the lab's smoldering ruins. We snuck up behind them and simultaneously gagging them so they couldn't call for help. Make any noise and you die, Cole hissed at them. We quickly bound the guards' hands and dragged them to a secure secondary location, the basement of a derelict building outside town. We wanted privacy for the interrogations. Inside the musty basement, lit only by our flashlights, we roughly tied the defiant guards to chairs. They glared at us silently refusing to talk. Cole brandished a large knife. We can do this the easy way or the fun way. Your choice. He slowly dragged the knife tip down one guard's cheek, just breaking the skin. The guard turned pale. Now tell us what we want to know, and this ends quickly, Cole growled. The guard stayed stubbornly silent, so Cole described in vivid, gruesome detail how we would slowly torture them for information. The mental imagery did the trick. Fearing prolonged agony and death, both guards quickly agreed to cooperate fully. I showed them photos of Rostin. Where did he go after the lab raid? One guard nervously responded, I don't know exactly, he has many hiding places, 
but probably the catacombs under the old chapel. Secret tunnels built long ago, easy to disappear there. This lined up with our suspicions. A maze of crypts would allow Rostin to move undetected. What's Rostin doing down there? Is he planning to escape the country? I pressed. He is angry, half mad they say after the attack, but not scared into hiding far away. He is recruiting more of us, getting weapons. He wants revenge. The other guard added, I heard them say if the situation becomes worse, they take Rostin out by sea, to a new lab in another land, but not yet. He wants you all dead first. This sense of Rostin's mindset was valuable, though troubling. A cornered enemy was even more dangerous. We might not get another shot at him. Cole drew the knife lightly across a guard's neck. Anything else useful you remember, now's the time. They rapidly shook their heads, pleading that they had told us everything. We had learned valuable intelligence, but kept the guards detained in case we needed more information. Their interrogations gave us a clearer picture of Rostin's movements and intentions after the lab's destruction. It also lent urgency to capturing him quickly before he could flee the region and disappear into obscurity abroad. This vital context from the guards allowed us to plan our next moves more strategically. We now knew Rostin was laying low in the ancient catacombs beneath the chapel, buying time to rebuild his forces and resources. We had to strike swiftly before he could unleash his deadly knowledge on the world again from the shadows. The comms buzzed with new instructions from Division Command Headquarters. Team Bravo, this is Command, do you copy? Solid copy, Command, responded Johnson. Be advised, your orders have changed. Rostin must be taken alive if possible for interrogation. His knowledge is invaluable for countermeasure development. Johnson acknowledged the order change, but with a skeptical tone. Affirmative, but capturing him risks casualties. Request clarification. The voice on the radio replied, Avoid detection and collateral damage as much as feasible, but Rostin's capture is now mission critical. We discussed options for taking Rostin into custody without getting ourselves killed in the process. Even with surprise and superior training, it would be extremely difficult given the close quarters and his loyal mercenaries. Based on interrogations of captured guards, Division Intel updated us that Rostin had likely retreated from the burning lab into ancient catacombs constructed beneath the village chapel centuries ago. A maze of crypts and tunnels allowed him to move undetected as he regrouped his forces. Trying to find Rostin down there would be like searching every cave in Afghanistan, argued Cole. We'd be sitting ducks wandering those tunnels blindly. But we had our orders. We'll set up close surveillance on the chapel. At some point Rostin will have to surface, that's when we grab him, said Johnson. A tenuous plan at best. We were also given code phrases to covertly identify ourselves as CIA to any friendly special forces units in the area that might assist in the hunt for Rostin. Their involvement had to avoid detection for now. Keeping Rostin's bioweapon capabilities secret remained critical. Once the extraction chopper arrived just after midnight, we headed out under cover of darkness toward the chapel location. My nerves burned with tension as we approached. Under the shadow of night, we approached the old village chapel where intel indicated Rostin had taken refuge. A perimeter of mercenaries guarded the grounds, but we neutralized them swiftly using silenced pistols and knives. Soon we were descending the stone steps into the ancient catacombs constructed beneath the chapel centuries ago. Dank subterranean air rushed to meet us as we switched on flashlights, illuminating the tunnels ahead. Our boots splashed through inches of stagnant water as we pressed forward. The maze of crypts and winding passages stretched for unknown miles in all directions. We had to be methodical in our search. Rostin could be hiding anywhere in this labyrinth. Keep your eyes peeled for any signs of activity or recent passage, I whispered, and be prepared for booby traps. We investigated one crypt after another, finding only corpses and artifacts from ages past. The deeper we explored, the heavier the silence felt, pressing in from all sides. Two hours later, Reed noticed scuff marks and footprints in one of the tunnels. 
Someone's been through here recently, he said. I nodded. Let's see where they lead. Soon we discovered more indications of regular traffic. Discarded ration tins, still smoldering torch sconces, cables running along walls. We were on the right path. He can't be far now, Cole muttered, gripping his weapon tighter. The trail kept angling downward into older and more primitive passages. Pieces of modern equipment, like portable lights, appeared more frequently. Stay tight, watch your sectors, I said. The rocky tunnels provided perfect positions for ambush. Rostin clearly knew we were coming. A feint up ahead finally reached our ears. Voices, machinery, movement. The wide tunnel opened into a large cavern, creating a natural bunker. Inside, a high-tech command center had been erected, with security cameras, computers, and weapons stations. We took cover behind stone pillars, observing for a moment. There's our rat, Cole said, pointing to a figure yelling orders, Rostin. This was his subsurface base of operations. We were ready to move in when a deafening blast shook the chamber. A section of the tunnel behind us collapsed, cutting off our backup route. Rostin had detonated time charges. His voice echoed through the cavern. Your pursuit ends here, fools. Guards suddenly appeared, raining gunfire down on our position. Outgunned, we had to retreat further into the cavern complex as bullets ricocheted around us. Rostin was making an escape under the cover of his men. Cole, Tyler, suppressing fire, I ordered. Reed, with me, we can't lose Rostin. We broke from cover, darting through the subterranean battlefield toward the far tunnel where Rostin had fled. The gunfire was deafening in the confined space. We dove and returned fire when possible, but had to keep Rostin in our sights. Up ahead, his silhouette disappeared into the darkness of an unexplored tunnel. With Cole and Tyler on our tails, we gave chase. The passages twisted erratically, but we followed smears of blood and dragging footprints left by the wounded scientist. He's desperate, bleeding, I said. We've almost got him. Reed was more cautious. Desperate men are dangerous men. Stay focused. The trail ended abruptly at a ladder leading up to a storm drain cover, Rostin's escape route. We emerged cautiously into the forest, just in time to see a camouflage truck speeding away into the night, carrying our target. No, we had him, I shouted in frustration, coming all this way only to watch him slip away at the last second. I knew we might not get another chance, but Reed calmed me down. We forced him to abandon his main base of operations. That's a major blow. He's not out of the fight, but this mistake will cost him dearly. I realized Reed was right. We had dealt Rostin a serious setback tonight. It wasn't a total victory, but the war was far from over. We would keep pursuing and find him again. With this operation compromised, he was on his heels now. It was only a matter of time. Our team entered the dense jungle at first light to track down Rostin before he could establish himself somewhere secret and potentially unleash his deadly neurotoxin virus globally. The vegetation was sweltering and oppressive. Humidity hung thick in the air, beating on our skin and gear. Our machetes swung rhythmically to cut a winding path through massive ferns, vines, and hanging roots as we advanced. The limited visibility and cramped environment left us vulnerable to ambush, so we remained hypervigilant for any signs of traps, tripwires, disturbed earth, or other activity among the foliage. We knew Rostin had extensive experience in these lands. The advantage was his. We also had to constantly be alert for infected wildlife or villagers. The neurotoxin Rostin developed could spread rapidly through blood and saliva contact, turning even small creatures primal, aggressive, and homicidal. As we came across empty villages, ransacked huts with blood-spattered walls made it clear they had already been overrun by the madness. No humans left alive, just remnants of the horror brought by Rostin's toxins. On the second day, our point man halted abruptly as he examined some broken branches and disturbed soil. He silently signaled for us to stop and take cover. These tracks seem intentionally left to manipulate our route, he whispered. 
Rostin's trying to hurt us somewhere. I nodded. He knows we're coming for him. Stay sharp for traps or ambushes. We proceeded more cautiously, but sure enough, continuing to follow the conspicuous trail of boot prints and broken foliage eventually led us straight into a camouflaged pit trap lined with sharpened bamboo spikes. We sensed the trap just in time and avoided falling in, but it confirmed our suspicion. Rostin was employing psychological games to slow our pursuit and inflict casualties. He knew we would do everything we could to track him. Cole spat on the ground. He's toying with us, letting us know he's in control out here. Mind games don't decide outcomes. Actions do, I replied. We stick to our training and finish this mission. Rostin's not thinking clearly right now. We can use that. From then on, we took even greater care to spot signs of deception or ambush along the trail. The intermittent boot prints, fabric scraps, and broken branches were clearly intended to steer our route into traps. We could not afford to let our guard down out here even for a moment. Rostin knew the terrain and our tactics intimately and would exploit any lapse in focus. We had to remain alert and be smarter than his tricks if we hoped to apprehend him. The element of surprise would be key. After a week of careful pursuit, the trail ended abruptly. We've lost him, Reed exclaimed in frustration. Our leads had run dry deep in the untamed jungle. He can't hide from us forever out here, Johnson said. Let's widen the search grid. He'll surface eventually. But days of fruitlessly combing the jungle put us increasingly on edge. Our supplies dwindled as the search dragged on with no further sign of Rostin. Doubts crept in that he had evaded us and disappeared. We couldn't afford any more delays. Rostin had to be found now before rebuilding his operation somewhere else. Just when it seemed hopeless, a break came. One of the local guides heard rumors of a concealed bunker spotted recently about ten clicks north. The description matched one of Rostin's suspected jungle outposts. It wasn't much, but our only lead. We cautiously moved to investigate. Now we just needed to infiltrate quickly and quietly to take Rostin totally by surprise. After weeks of pursuit, today it ended. Failure was not an option. Under the faint moonlight, we approached the concealed bunker entrance we had under surveillance for over 24 tense hours. Two heavily armed mercenary guards were posted outside the steel door. Loyal fighters contracted to protect Rostin at all costs. We needed to neutralize them quickly and quietly if we hoped to infiltrate undetected. I signaled Tyler to circle west and take up a flanking position in the dense jungle foliage. I would mirror his movement to the east. Reed and Cole nodded, hanging back to provide overwatch and cover our stealthy approach. On my discreet hand signal, Tyler and I simultaneously crept forward toward the unsuspecting guards. In a lightning-fast surprise attack, we dashed the last ten meters from the brush and slit both guards' throats before they could cry out or react. As they slumped to the ground, we dragged their bodies out of sight into the nearby undergrowth. Cole and Reed moved up to the bunker entrance and I joined them, keying in the stolen access codes on the locking keypad. It flashed green after a moment, and the heavy steel door unsealed with a metallic clunk. We were in. Inside was a narrow passage sloping down into the earth. One by one, we descended the steel ladder rungs into the tunnel, the stale underground air and rock walls closing in oppressively as we dropped thirty feet or more. My nerves burned with anticipation about what awaited us below. At the bottom opened up a dimly lit maze of concrete corridors lined with pipes and wiring. We switched our night vision goggles on, bathing the cold utilitarian hallways in an eerie green hue that amplified the tactical rifles and gear strapped to our bodies. Following the rough facility maps acquired through intel sources, we silently wound our way toward the central hub. The entire base had an atmosphere of desertion and foreboding, our strained breathing and footfalls the only sounds cutting through the stillness. Besides the background mechanical hum of generators, there were no signs of activity or life. No guards, techs, nothing. I've got a bad feeling about this, muttered Cole under his breath. 
I nodded grimly. Where was everyone? Something didn't feel right. We kept our rifles on hair trigger, anticipating an ambush ahead from the shadows. Entering the surveillance room at the heart of the facility, the mystery of the missing personnel was chillingly solved. Banks of security camera monitors showed the maze of corridors and containment chambers, rapidly filling with dozens of infected villagers. The underground tunnels had funneled them straight toward our position within the base. Rostin had clearly triggered their mass release remotely, intentionally flooding his own facility with these violent human test subjects. He knew we were here, and he was using these poor souls turned mindless weapons as the first line of defense. My God, he's unleashed them, Cole uttered in horror. We need to get out of here now. But any exit was already cut off. At that moment, steel blast doors around the perimeter of the surveillance hub slammed shut in sequence with echoing booms. We were sealed in. Seconds later, the air vents opened and a faint mist began pouring throughout the corridors. One whiff and I instantly recognized the compound, Rostin's experimental neurotoxin formula, concentrated into gas form. He was exposing us to the full effects of the psychosis-inducing drug. The speakers in the ceiling crackled to life. Rostin's voice echoed through them, amplified to a menacing bellow by the concrete tunnels. Did you really think I wasn't prepared for this? That I wouldn't take precautions in the event my operation was compromised from within? His tone turned mocking, taunting us. No, I've planned this contingency for quite some time, and now you will suffer a fate far worse than death. Rostin's deranged laughter echoed down the corridors, mixed with distant shrieks and screams rapidly approaching from the maze of hallways around us. The infected were close. We quickly put on gas masks to filter out the airborne toxin, but the masks would only last for so long. And the hordes of bloodthirsty infected villagers roaming free in here with us pose just as deadly a threat now. We needed to find a way out fast, or we would become prey just like them. Rostin clearly had all the advantages, the environment, the infected at his command, the traps and toxins he had prepared. He knew we were coming, and had been waiting eagerly. This would be a fight to the death, and the odds were firmly against us surviving. On my signal, we fought as a disciplined unit, firing steady select bursts while moving quickly down the east corridor, the only open escape path available. As we advanced, we knifed and clubbed the endless waves of crazed infected villagers that threw themselves at us. The toxin had robbed them of all reason and self-preservation. They felt no pain or fear, only violent psychotic madness, driven by raw animal impulse to kill and destroy. They clawed, punched, and bit at us viciously as we battled through their midst. But we kept our training and focus. Failure here meant a gruesome death. After what felt like hours of battling through dozens more of the infected in the maze of hallways, we finally reached a locked security door and barricaded ourselves inside, finding it appeared to be the communications control room. Outside in the concrete corridor, the relentless horde immediately began pounding and clawing on the reinforced metal door. Reed examined the entryway while reloading his weapon. This door won't hold them back forever, he said grimly pointing to the buckling steel hinges. The enraged infected mob would be on us again soon if we didn't act quickly. Any way to call for backup or extract? Asked Cole desperately. But the comms channels were dead. Rostin had cut off all outside contact down here. We were well and truly on our own. I tried to exude confidence despite the odds, rallying the exhausted team. We've survived this long through worse than this. Stay frosty and we'll make it out, just like always. But the reality was, we remained trapped deep in this nightmare labyrinth, swarming with maniacal infected humans. We had no route of escape or any real way to fight our way clear against their sheer numbers. Still, giving up was not even a consideration. It was endure and overcome, or die trying. We reloaded weapons and braced our nerves for the next confrontation. Either we figured out an escape from this death trap, or we would be torn to shreds and join the infected roaming these halls. But quitting was not who we were. 
Suddenly, the locking mechanism on the heavy door began turning as it slowly started to open. We spun and prepared to immediately fire on whatever fresh horrors entered. Then a startled voice cried, Wait, don't shoot! In stumbled two uniformed lab technicians, hands raised and just as shocked to see us survivors as we were them. They must have been trapped down here during the lockdown too. Do you know a way out of here? I asked. They quickly nodded and motioned for us to follow closely. With the frenzied horde fast approaching again down the corridor, we swiftly pursued the two technicians through a maze of maintenance tunnels and access ways. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, we reached a ladder leading up to the surface. The cool night jungle air had never tasted sweeter as we emerged from the earth. I turned to the two technicians who aided our escape. Is there another way back in to reach the central hub? We need to stop Dr. Rostin once and for all. The female tech replied hastily. Yes, I can show you a maintenance tunnel that will bypass upper level containment. But you saw what he's unleashed down there. Going back would be suicide. We don't have a choice, I responded. Lead the way. She reluctantly led us to a hidden side passage. One by one, we descended cautiously back into the earth. The air grew colder and stale again as we wound our way toward Rostin's lair. Up ahead, the sounds of shrieking and pounding reached our ears. The infected horde was still roaming these tunnels. We would need to fight through them again to reach Rostin. Switching off safeties, we steeled ourselves for combat and continued forward. Turning the corner, we opened fire into a mass of deranged infected villagers, dropping them before they could react. But gunshots echoed far in these confined spaces. Soon, more crazed hordes came running toward the commotion. Wave after wave of vicious infected attacked, impervious to pain or injury. We had to expend every round while retreating faster toward the central hub chamber. Our window was closing. They just kept coming. Finally, we made it through the last infected mob blocking our path and burst into the main hub room. And there was Rostin, frantically trying to escape while his recorded voice taunted us overhead. You are weak-minded fools, it repeated from hidden speakers. Embrace your infection or perish. Seeing us, Rostin made a dash toward a hidden side door. But Tyler was faster, tackling him violently to the hard floor. We surrounded Rostin, weapons aimed directly at him. The end had come for this madman and his sick ambitions. You are too late, Rostin spat defiantly. The age of the infected has already begun. I smashed my gunstock across his face, silencing further rants. He would answer for his crimes against humanity. I ordered Cole and Reed to take Rostin into custody while Tyler and I rigged explosives to collapse the complex. We had to bury this evil forever. Hustling Rostin through the corpse-strewn tunnels, we detonated the charges and continued toward the surface exit. Fiery explosions tore through the underground base behind us. Rostin screamed and struggled against his restraints, but he was powerless now. We left the blazing bunker, the inferno consuming all traces of Rostin's horrific schemes. Justice had been dealt this day for his countless victims. Under heavy guard, Rostin was transported to a black site facility to fully chronicle his research into the neurotoxin virus for countermeasure development by CIA scientists. Any further useful knowledge to extract from him would be gained. Then he would rot in solitary darkness for eternity, forgotten by history. No mercy would be shown to one such as him. The outbreak zone village was razed and sterilized. Unable to cure the infected, we provided the only merciful release possible, a quick and painless end, finally freeing them from their uncontrolled torment. It was a graveyard now, the infected threat forever neutralized under scorched earth. I took one last look at the smoldering ruins visible in the valley below. It's been one year since we took down Rostin and destroyed his neurotoxin virus for good. As I walk the streets of DC today on my way to headquarters, Fragments of memories from those tense days still occasionally surface at odd moments. Brief flashes of the infected villagers, their crazed violence, and their utter lack of humanity. 
the feeling of being hunted through that remote wilderness by a brilliant yet deranged adversary. My own doubts that we would make it out of there alive. But we persevered and succeeded against all odds. Rostin is now locked away in a black hole prison from which he'll never emerge again. His nightmarish viral research is eradicated from existence. The threat he posed is permanently neutralized. I think often of the infected villagers whose lives were destroyed by Rostin's insanity. We had no choice but to end the suffering his virus caused them. Their faces still haunt me some nights. If only we could have reached them sooner. But dwelling on regrets is counterproductive in this line of work. The focus must remain on the next mission, the next threat we must confront and overcome in defense of this nation and its people. The enemies of freedom never sleep, so neither can we. The past is the past, though never forgotten. I check my secured email for updates on my next assignment and gear up to hit the field again. The mission details are still classified, but I'm confident in my training and experience. Whether infiltrating a terrorist network, tracking a rogue agent, or thwarting a biological attack, I stand ready to act. To face any threat without hesitation, to do what must be done. No matter the odds, I know we won't fail when lives hang in the balance. Failure is not an option. My team enters the briefing room, faces showing the same solemn determination I feel. We've been through hell together already. No matter what comes next, we're prepared to follow orders and get the job done like only we can. This is what we were born to do. To walk in darkness so others don't have to. There is no turning back now, only the mission ahead. And no matter where that takes us, we move forward together with a focused purpose. Ready for anything.